Well, welcome everyone. It is uh, my pleasure to be able to kind of kick off this conversation. Uh, my name is Carrie Farquhar. I'm the interim chair. I'm going to use a microphone. Are they going to use microphones? I was trying to be kind of a little bit, a little bit louder. Louder. Okay. So, uh, I'm the interim chair in the Department of Global Health, and uh, really pleased to welcome all of you to this event. Uh, it's uh, sponsored by the UW Consortium for Global Mental Health and also the Population Health Initiative. And uh, we have two illustrious conversants who will be uh, will dialogue here around some really important uh, issues. Um, ben Danielson is the director of Ashe, and uh, he, I'll just say a little bit about Ashe, and then I think we'll be hearing more from him that it's uh, working to create a world without harmful youth incarceration and promote up to solutions centered on the health and well being of children and youth. And uh, Dr. Danielson is also the Barton Distinguished Endowed Chair for Youth Justice and Health Equity. Uh, he serves on statewide boards for youth justice and partners with King County to decommission the Youth Detention Center. That's not enough. He's also a clinical professor of pediatrics uh, here at University of Washington. Helen, I actually have known for quite some time. Dr. Helen Jack is a, a clinician and researcher. She's an assistant professor in the Division of uh, General Internal Medicine uh, in the uh, Department of Medicine. She's also core faculty in the Consortium for Global Mental Health, and her research takes place in low-middle-income settings, uh, Zimbabwe in particular, um, and her practice, clinical practice, is in, within the state prison uh, system in medium and minim, minimum security prisons in uh, rural eastern Washington. So I think we're going to be hearing some very interesting uh, discussion today and really a real kind of wealth of Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's so nice for us to just have a one-on-one, -on -one, very personal, like a chance to talk with everybody else around <laughs> going to this company. Exactly. What a setting. <laughs> How are you? Good. Really glad to be here. How are you? I'm grateful. Uh, there are so many people doing incredible work uh, in these areas. And I feel like you are at this commissure, at this nexus of a lot of really important things. So uh, I'm just ready to sop up some wisdom and just really hear more about how you think about your work, not just how it's done, but how you think about it. Because uh, I just, I think you're brilliant. Yeah. No, I, I feel similarly. I think I look at what you and your partners have achieved in King County and, and the work that you're doing and the compassion that you bring to it and look forward to hearing how you got there and, and what drives you to this work. Um, and I think the theme of this conversation really is mental health and incarceration right. and from, from sort of a global and local perspective. And I wonder if we should start just by talking about what we think about that relation, like what, what that relationship is, the relationship oh, yeah. between mental health and incarceration. I would love to hear that, especially because uh, they feel almost covalently bound or part of some double helix or something intertwined in a particular way. And I wonder how that lands for you, how you think about that, that weird duality, um, really tragic kind of relationship. I mean, I think mental health is both a cause and consequence um, of incarceration. And we so often see people who have behaviors that are a result of mental health conditions um, who end up incarcerated because of those behaviors. I mean, between 15 and 20% of people are intoxicated um, when they, at the time that they commit a crime or they are committing what is labeled as criminal behavior in order to get money to purchase um, drugs. And I think we so often see these behavioral symptoms criminalized in various ways or people whose circumstances have led to trauma and, and, and sort of resulting mental health conditions are disproportionately those who, who are incarcerated. Um, yet prison and jail are also profoundly stressful, chaotic places. Yeah. And um, 
being separated from your family, being separated from the community. We know how important social support is for everyone's mental wellness and incarceration often keeps people from that nidus of social support that they find in their community and puts them in a setting where that is absent. And not only is that absent, but it's a place where there is violence and trauma. And I think one of the things that has surprised me as a clinician working in prisons is the amount of uncertainty that there can be, that every day you might be moved to a different prison across the state, even further from your family. Or um, our patients um, don't always know when they, they are not allowed to know when they have medical procedures off site. And so sometimes they, I had a patient who was going to get open heart surgery and because he's not allowed to know the date, he told me that every day for more than a month, he woke up wondering if that would be the day he would have open heart surgery. That is inhumane. That is absolutely inhumane. Wow. Um, and I think that um, that level of uncertainty, I think, just can cause certainly a, a, a large amount of stress. Is doesn't feel like it captures it for people who are incarcerated. But I'm curious how you see this relationship. Um, inextricable and um, some weird Mobius strip of like just looping right back uh, to each other, uh, almost as if by design. And what I find challenging is also that it is so easy to get just stuck in a conversation about um, individual behaviors and individuals who transgress what we call laws. And um, I mean, I just have to be honest, I think the problem is a criminal justice system and the systems that feed into it. The problem is not that we have so much, all right, you're gonna probably protect me on this. Maybe not so much that we have a mental health crisis, but we have a mental health support crisis. And um, so I find myself wanting to avoid devolving into what this person did, what this, what happened to this, what we call patient or um, something and try to really focus on what is it about our construction and almost um, vicious upholding of really harmful intertwined maladaptive ecosystems that that fosters this kind of environment. Um, we go straight to blaming a mental health problem on a person. We go straight to blaming um, a system that is actually out there looking to identify people who face trauma and then traumatize them further. I've heard people in different spaces talk about that, um, almost that adage that hurt people hurt people. Um, and I back that up a little bit and I, I, I think about our systems of incarceration hurt, hurt people. Seek them out, target them, look at them from, from infancy, from before infancy. Uh, continue to look for the opportunity to create a criminalizing kind of um, label and then to relabel, relabel and convince somebody uh, that they're broken, that they're not well. Uh, I don't know. I get so spun up in this sometimes that it's, it just feels important for us to first absolutely affirm the humanity of everyone who is involved, even, even the people who are actually working in those systems. Um, and then I just really want us to be talking about what we need to do about, about that harmful construct that's made by humans to hurt humans. Uh, which also means like in my most hopeful moments that humans can undo, can recreate, can reimagine, can transform. We, we absolutely can do that. Um, and I love the idea that that's possible. And I think it takes the kind of uh, connectedness that you've really maintained. And you've done this like in a super personal way. I talk about systems, but I know it's still humans, people. If you stay really connected to people, you've done this in a systemic way. Uh, you talk about communities and everything else around it. You've done it even in this like geopolitical global manner. And um, like, how do you hold that all in your head? It feels like you're going from person to system to mega system back to person, maybe all day. Is that is that part of the way you 
do you see your your professional existence? Oh man, I've I've so many. So yeah, many yeah, thoughts. go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think first of all, I appreciate how much you recognize systems there. That this isn't necessarily. That this is certainly not an individual. It's not a broken mental health system. It's broken systems of care or, and systems of support and communities of support. Is it possible they're support. not broken too? Or the systems of care that need to be designed, designed perfectly. Designed better. They're working exactly the way they're designed. They're doing, they're, they've been designed to harm, especially especially black and brown people, Absolutely. especially LGBTQIA2 spirit plus people, especially people who face foster care, especially people who who have been systematically harmed already. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Um, and I think in my own role, and I, I speak here as someone who works as a primary care physician in the state prison system, but certainly my views spoken here do not represent those of the Department of Corrections. Um, but when I'm doing clinical work, I'm there to see patients. And that yeah. feels so personal and so human and so important to be able to be really sort of trying to walk alongside people who have been failed by systems again and again and again. And disproportionately black and brown people, disproportionately people who have mental health conditions, disproportionately people with addiction, disproportionately people who have suffered traumatic brain injuries, that like these are the people who may be incarcerated and who have every reason not to trust a medical provider, not to have been harmed by so many systems. And I think I um, work within a system where people are incarcerated, but also trying to provide care to those who are who are within that system and still very human and, and deserving of care. Um, but I think what has to be what has to accompany that is thinking about these system level questions yeah, yeah. of how in small way, it's, it feels like patient care through these individual encounters, there's these moments of like, oh, something got better today. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in these system level conversations, it can feel like what is getting better today? Yeah, yeah. It's such a puzzle piece of you're just chipping away at, at these much larger problems. And I think one question I, I have for you is you've done such work reducing the number of youth who are incarcerated in Cape County and that it's gone from 200 to 20. And that's an effort that I can only imagine took a lot of people and a lot of effort. And I'm really curious to hear more about how that came about. Well, super important cor correction. You know, that was other people's brilliance that have really done that. And um, I'll even tell you, I might've been a little bit of a hater of some of those people uh, back in the day, because I was doing all this, um, this like, discrete binary thinking about things. Uh, and just to get to the point, I was, I, I'm, I'm in the space of abolition, I'm absolutely in the space of abolition. If you have a, uh, a set of systems, an ecosystem that is so particularly racist and harmful, you have to prove to me that it should even exist in the first place. And then you have to, you have to create something that is, that is different than that. So uh, if you're a human on this planet, uh, you know, for me, it's like, you have to, you have to sort of come from there. So I think I was kind of like, I used to be kind of a hater of, of reformists. Um, I'll just be honest. Uh, and then I started to think about it, you know, when I started working at this clinic that was just, whatever, six blocks from Juby, from the youth detention center. Um, there were, in any given day, 200 young people in there. And by the time um, 2019 rolled around, after I'd been there in that clinic for two decades, there were on some days 20 or less uh, youth there. And that was the work of reform. Um, and as somebody who really is leaning much more into this abolition space, I so I had to admit to myself, if I come and talk to you or to someone else in some space about like, we need to do away with, like we really could, should envision a world without incarcerating young people. When there's 200 young people there every day, it's, it's actually really hard for other people to envision that. When there's 20 or 12, or 10, like zero is is actually possible. So got to give credit to reform and, and the work in ways that um, dyadically, like like you, moving across systems, interpersonal healthcare, criminal justice, um, those the possibility of working together is so much more powerful than like standing righteously in some one spot and saying everyone else has it wrong. So reform is really powerful. And we've slipped 
terribly backwards since then, right? 2019, yeah, there were days when there were 20 uh, young people, as horrible as that already is, uh, at the King County Youth Detention Center. Uh, today, it's more like 50 or 60. And um, there are people who've been there, uh, you probably know this, uh, there's some young people who've been there for three years. Uh, those detention centers are designed in the system, in the maladaptive system to be uh, two weeks placements and things like that while something is happening. So we've completely, completely created, um, almost amplified the toxicity and the trauma that we're causing to people. And we've dialed up the racism too. In 2019, uh, if you were in King County and you your skin color was close to mine and you were male and young, uh, you know, you were you were six times overrepresented in youth detention. And even as we've been doing lots of things to uh, create reforms, uh, if you look at that today, uh, you're 11 times more likely, if you're Black, uh, to be incarcerated as a young person. It makes me think about how sometimes we try to improve things and we use this approach that gets to numerical improvement, uh, but I think it wounds our souls when it comes to really thinking about about fairness, about justice, about, about equity, about anti-racism. And um, I don't know, I feel like in some ways you get to see this both inside this this country, but as I heard, you're, a lot of your work is in Zimbabwe. Um, I want to get into this sort of, what is your international take on this? How do you see what we call racism here and our, our colorism, especially that's part of that, um, and its relationship to what you might see in, in some of your other work? That's a good question. Um, I didn't originally start working in Zimbabwe to look at prisons. Right, right. right. I, I started looking working in Zimbabwe, helping a Zimbabwean team do a study about the mental health system. And we just went around and we asked people, like, what is what are important issues facing Zimbabwe's mental health system? Like, where are, where are care delivered? Like, a pretty standard health system type yeah. survey. We didn't ask about prison. And I think we were surprised how many of our informants who were policymakers, they were at the Ministry of Health, they were psychiatrists, they were psychologists said, oh yeah, I spend a day a week delivering care in the prison system. Or a lot of care is delivered within the prison system. Um, a real problem in our mental health system is the board that is meant to review cases of people who have mental illness, who are currently incarcerated and need to be released. They've stopped meeting because the government has stopped paying them. So now no one with mental illness can get out of prison. Wow. So we kept hearing that a lot of mental health care was delivered within the prison system and that the prison system had failed people with mental illness. And I think as someone coming from the US, like that shouldn't have been a surprise because that is similar to, I think, our system here. But it was a surprise yeah. because in global mental health, that isn't really a conversation about prison. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, there are 2 million people incarcerated in the US and estimates on Sub-Saharan Africa are not great, but it's probably about 800,000 across the whole country. Yeah, we're super good at we're, we're We incarcerate a lot of people yeah, in the US. Yeah. So one thing Sub-Saharan Africa does really well is incarcerate way fewer people. But if the conditions that those people are living in and the human rights abuses and the fact that they do not have sort of any recourse within the justice system um, is, still a human rights violation. Yeah. It's still a lot of people. And when you look at things like WHO mental health guidelines, there's no mention of incarceration. Mm. There's no mention of forensic psychiatry. There's no mention of the trauma related to incarceration. And I think talking to colleagues in Zimbabwe who are seeing this all the time. Real time. Real time. Right there. Yeah. When I was in Zimbabwe in November, I was talking to a psychiatrist who said she was asked to work in the prison system. She really wanted to work with this patient population. Yeah. But there's also such a political overlay that she was worried that there would be enough political prisoners put in, incarcerated by the opposition party that who were being held for not due to mental health conditions or but because they had resisted yeah. the single party in power. You must be crazy to resist. Right, exactly. Them. And she, she was meant to go diagnose them. Um, and so I think that... Um, political overlay speaks to the different levels of sort of discrimination and power yeah, yeah. that play into who is incarcerated and who is not. 
one thing, another thing we heard in our interviews with people in Zimbabwe was that mental health conditions are so stigmatized that people who were labeled as having a mental illness and stole a loaf of bread would be incarcerated because that's where you belong. Um, and so I think it is certainly an intersecting set of system, a system that is designed to harm yeah. to what we see in the US, yet a distinct set of political and socioeconomic challenges that are less part of the public discourse than they are here. Shut out. Don't look at it. Don't see it. Don't talk about it. Exactly. Wow. Freedom is fleeting. Yeah. When we think about both reform and abolition, whether that's in Zimbabwe or in King County, it's such a process and involves bringing so many different people together. And I can only imagine that in your, the efforts you've been involved in to push for abolition, but perhaps to push through abolition through reform, you had to bring together a lot of different parties yeah. to the table. And I'm curious what strategies you've used to, to do that, to bring together people who want to work towards this change. It's a really great question. There's so many ways uh, to do it wrong. And I, I'm sure I will find 99 out of 100 of them in the work we're trying to do. One project we're trying to start up, uh, which is about to get going, uh, it's interesting to me because, uh, well, to start with, the name for ASHE, which is a long acronym, does not mention incarceration uh, because the the faith that I have in young people transcends that condition and that space and that place. And I refuse to like lend light to it if I can avoid that. And in service to that, sort of trying to do a project um, that uh, supports one arm of the work we're doing. Uh, the center is, has a sort of uh, well, a lot of duality today, mental health and prison. Um, in the center, we talk about unbuilding the fortifiers, uh, the fortifications of incarceration and building up the fortifiers of hope and health in young people. Um, I think for a lot of people doing great work, we get so overwhelmed by just trying to stave off the horrible things that are happening. Um, we often don't have the mental space, the emotional space, the, the space space, <laughs> the resource space to actually think about uh, what it would be like uh, to be in a better place. And uh, pretty convinced that if you're going without a compass, if you're really just going by trying to get rid of all of the things that you hate, you will never know where you're going <laughs> or where you're trying to get to. So this project is trying to get people who've been struggling through the, just staving off the urgencies and the crises and the harm to actually spend a little bit of time each month thinking about what it would look like to get there. Uh, what it would look like to create and support and pour all of our love into communities such that the conversation about, about unhoused youth, the conversation about youth incarceration would be rendered unimaginable. What would it be like or for those working at Treehouse and Choose 180 and Community Passageways and uh, all of the recidivism uh, preventing programs and all of those things, what it would it look like for a, for a public defender or a judge to actually spend a little bit of time talking about what, uh, what a community that has all that it needs uh, and is so able to rebuff the factors that are seeking to incarcerate them seeking to cause harm to their young people, um, they're able to withstand that. Um, I like the idea of uh, what I would think about is pragmatic dreaming, like that there is a way to envision that and for us to get from here to there. But as long as we're playing uh, what I would call sort of an away game, uh, a defensive game where we're just trying to stave off the things that are happening to us, uh, it's a really good strategy for us to never actually lend like your brilliance to what it would look like to get there. So that's the idea of this uh, uh, project, which actually takes a lot of talking people into because it sounds really weird. Like, um, they're sort of like, well, yeah, what will you do? And I'm saying uh, this cohort of people, uh, this co-design group are gonna collaborate mm -hmm. at, under the watchful eye of youth who've been most impacted under their designing leadership and under their vetting of ideas. Uh, this group is gonna generate ideas. Well, which is one of the hardest things to get a funder to fund. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. 
it, it does strike me that we, as you say, work in extremely reactive systems. Yeah. It is so easy to respond to the board in Zimbabwe isn't meeting. We need to figure out how to get the board to meet and get the people out. Right. right. That doesn't do anything about the situation in prisons, but it might get a few people out. Yeah. Or Are there things this patient is sick today. Are I mean, you able to get into that like so innovative I'm, creative space a little bit? Or? Sometimes. It's yeah. hard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in my clinical role, there's a bit of a duality that in some ways clinical medicine in primary care is responding to someone walking in the room and saying, my leg hurts, I'm having GI symptoms, like whatever they're coming, yeah. I need you, I have this problem. Yeah. But fundamentally our job in primary care is to do primary prevention, yeah. to keep it from happening in the first place, yeah, yeah, yeah. to screen for colon cancer and get people started on statins before they've had a heart attack and, and do the work of primary prevention. And I think we don't often think about mental wellness from that primary prevention standpoint. Right. That very rarely do my patients come to me and say, I'm feeling really okay. great mentally and I'd like to stay that yeah, way. Yeah. Um, or I have this like small thing that I'm worried might turn into something bigger. Can we handle that now? It's like the way that patients will present to me when they're having a, anything to do with their mental health is often after it's already caused harm to them. And so sometimes trying to think about what would system level primary prevention look like to start that statin before things fall apart um, sometimes helps me get into that headspace. And I think there's a lot of conversation around, for instance, first responders and should we have yeah. social workers instead of police be We're first responders. That right You're experimenting and I think we need to experiment with it more. Yeah. Um, I think it's an amazing an amazing thing to be experimenting with, but how could we prevent that mental health, health crisis from happening in yeah. the first place? And I think often, even within, there's like a, a program in, in Olympia, I believe, that's experimenting with social workers as first yeah. responders. Yeah. And then once someone's been sort of a, a frequent flyer in that, then they get additional services. But what would it look like to, for those services before the Sentinel event to do primary rather than secondary prevention? I love that. I love that dreaming and that. Uh, really opening up possibilities. I like the idea of uh, rather than thinking about just where we are and what's what we consider usual and normal, uh, how do we step step out of that? You are seeing so many things in so many spaces and places. I just imagine um, the, your ability to kind of um, shift and adjust to different conditions must be pretty incredible. I wanted to ask you, uh, Two set two questions, but the same question. What does a good day look like for you when you're working uh, in an Eastern Washington uh, unjust prison? Uh, and what does it look like on a good day for you to be working in Zimbabwe? What's a good day? It's a good question. I think part of what I what gives me energy in the work that I do is that I can see patients, which feels very immediate, yeah. and then also take a step back and be a little less reactive. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so a good day of seeing patients looks really different than a good day of doing research. A lot of the work that I've done within the prison system from a very, very incremental reform perspective is on diabetes care. Oh, So I helped write our guidelines for delivery of diabetes care and add not you. Yeah. <laughs> so we can, we have new medicines to treat yeah. diabetes and we have some guidelines on how yeah. to treat diabetes. Yeah. So a lot of things that while a lot of work of my clinical work is seeing people whose A1C is greater than nine. And I see them until their A1C gets less than nine. And then I return them to their usual providers who are nurse practitioners and PAs. Nice. And um, I really love that. Yeah. Diabetes is extremely satisfying to treat because there's a number, it was nine and yeah. now it's seven. Mm -hmm. And like, your risk of heart attack and stroke is lower and you feel better and you yeah. it's a person it's a whose person life arc could be really different because and yeah. and with whom I've built a relationship yeah. because my patients intrinsically don't trust this system and and to introduce a new medication to a patient is a real like relationship building exercise every time yeah um yeah they invest some trust in you yeah if you're going to take something I prescribe you have to believe I'm not 
experimenting on you. Yeah. And I think that that, both from research that we've done and from my own patient care experience, people very rightly, because this population of people who are incarcerated and particularly black people who are incarcerated, like that's happened historically. There's, and I think building that trust is important and, and having those relationships is important. But I think if I, I, I appreciate that I then get to take a step back and my work in Zimbabwe is much more around like really big picture questions of how do we design systems of care to better serve people with mental health conditions. That's what I mean. You're flexing like the Catholic, you know, like a fast twitch muscle in this situation. Then you got this sort of long marathon like ability and these other that's that's really is it unique? Are you unique in that way? Because um, I think a lot of people end up feeling like they are in one space where they're going to be doing their best work. Zimbabwe and rural state prisons don't always necessarily have to feel different, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we're thinking about historically marginalized populations facing enormous socioecological stressors yeah. and where we are building new systems of care across cultural and system perspectives and thinking about how to, I'm particularly interested in integrating behavioral health into primary care. It's a problem everywhere. That and I think we, into both, yeah, it's, all it's of those. It exposes in both spaces. And if we think about global health as like them over there, oh. I think we do a disservice to how much we can learn from other settings as well as how the pers this perspective of humility that we can bring to the work, I can probably learn far more from my colleagues in Zimbabwe than I can bring as someone working there um, and trying to see rather than, I think often our academic departments and our training programs say, there's community health, that's domestic, and there's global health, that's in low and middle income countries. Right. When often I think they cross so many lines. And they could learn so much. And we could other. learn so much from each other and take a more decolonizing perspective if we're able to better bring those worlds together and take a more mutual capacity building lens to dial them. down for me. Like what's what's something from Zimbabwe that you would love to see brought into the mental health or mental health and prison intersection here in the US? So there's a Zimbabwean psychiatrist, Dixon Chibanda, who is amazing and, and created a program called the Friendship Bench. It's a six session. The Friendship Bench? The Friendship Bench. I love it already. The six session lay health worker delivered therapy. It's delivered sitting on benches outside of primary care clinics, often by older women in the community who are lay health workers. They have an eighth grade education. They are sort of respected elders. elders. And they've gotten very basic training in problem solving therapy. So helping someone who is identified as having anxiety or depression in a primary health care setting, who meet, meets with them and helps them come up with what the problem is that is most troubling them and helps them innovate a solution over six sessions. Did a randomized controlled trial, turns out helps. And I think it's scalable in that these are community members, but I think it also taps into community resources. Yeah, it's something and we're it's missing. culturally um, appropriate and is really something that's missing in these communities and can be scaled and can be trusted. And in this very stigmatized context, it would it's, it's really filled a niche and is now being scaled up around the country. It's beautiful. And I would love to see that here. I'm just starting a study around opioid use disorder screening in prisons. And we interviewed someone and we asked, how would you like to have a conversation about identifying what resources you might need while you're still incarcerated to set you up for substance use treatment or harm reduction upon release? And he said, I'd want that delivered by a peer. I'd want to sit down with someone who's walked in my shoes yeah. and I'd want to talk to them about what screening or treatment I need. Yeah. And like, despite having worked in Zimbabwe for 10 years, it had never occurred to me that we might have peer delivered substance use screening and peer delivered sort of services around what do you need right now? Beautiful. And that that would be the only way thing he would respond to. And that's like such a, struck me as such a parallel. And it taps into this uh, feeling, this, this known thing that I'm uh, really wanting to live into as much as possible, which is those closest to uh, the experiences, the traumas, the, the lived expertise, the living expertise, uh, the best solutions.
and if we really found ways to listen and implement, uh, we'd be moving a lot faster, perhaps. No, absolutely. And I, I would. You mentioned that there is a group of youth who advise the work that you're doing and guide it and check it and make sure that it works. Tell me more about that. Well, um, everything we do is layered, right? And if uh, if I had to like drink a truth serum and talk about like what my ultimate uh, desire would be is to cultivate as many generations of leaders of youth, as youth and youth who become leaders throughout their lives as possible. That's we're talking about transforming, of really seeing a different kind of future. Um, we need to be cultivating that, and uh, for all the things we do in the moment, let's close this prison. Let's uh, envision a, a projects that really build into our communities what they need. Um, let's uh, let's spend time working on issues like gun violence and this and that. Um, those are really important things to do. And if you are not cultivating youth leadership, uh, I don't think you're doing anything. Yeah. How do you cultivate youth leadership? Like that, that vision of well, youth leadership and yeah. and the bringing the true expertise through lived experience to bear on problems yeah. and on solutions is, is so powerful. But is- The first piece is actually the work that we so-called adults need to do and really understanding where adultism really is so, so deeply infused into everything that you almost, um, it's easy not to notice it, or it's really hard to shift yourself out of it. Uh, I think another piece is um, cultivating might even be the wrong word. I'll, I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll laugh at myself for using that word someday, I'm sure, because, uh, you know, all the youth I've gotten to know as a, as a pediatrician, as a, somebody working uh, in these different spaces. They're brilliant already, just absolutely brilliant. And um, uh, our ability to see that and recognize that is, is a bigger challenge than something about like infusing it or, or growing it. Also, I think um, we owe an intergenerational set of relationships uh, that somehow uh, on my rainier, cloudier days, it feels like this society just seems like it doesn't need somehow um, like your example of elders actually just sitting with somebody and, and I assume listening more than anything else um, that's magic and it's basic at the very same time and I think that's that's just a really powerful uh, piece I also um, they ask you so they tell you and um, they're I can't name them all right now off the top of my head so excuse me but uh, there's these eight things that every time I you know, interact, you just hear them show up all the time. They're things like um, pay us. <laughs> yep. um, uh, don't just show up once, like actually keep showing up. Um, make it clear to us that uh, you're actually acting on the things that we are saying. Um, have people that look like us and have lived uh, in ways that are uh, identifiable to us um, interact with us. Um, there's things like that. They kept keep showing up in all of these conversations. So they know we got to do our work. Uh, there are ways in which I think it's just really about relationship. And uh, sometimes I think we make up a lot of excuses to hang out with each other and, and do things. And it's more about it's more about the hanging out than it is about whatever grand, sophisticated idea, research, policy, blah, 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 that we develop. Yeah. That's I, that sounds childish, but I'm going to embrace that childishness too. Right. Because I think that's a brilliance. Absolutely. And it is often so hard to incorporate the most important voices into these conversations. Yeah. And something I struggle with every day and wish was easier, but it's so hard. It's hard. This project we're doing, um, we're pulling the youth piece together first yeah. uh, so that uh, it really feels like it's their space not sort of coming into something that's been preformed by these other participants who are who are so-called adults so yeah. um, the little things like that, that you can choose to do right. uh, there's probably two or three key questions you could ask yourself but each step along the way am i am i uh missing an opportunity for um uh the voice of lived expertise and living experience uh to, to show up here uh, have i actually created space uh to listen to to youth, um, uh, will I be able to show this young person that 
that what they said to me made a difference. Okay. Yeah, so those three questions. Like, if you do that in every interaction, I wonder how many different things you do. What different things would happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you must come into, okay, this is a little bit of a harder, harder question. But you're working uh, with folks in prison systems, uh, feel very much like the work that they do is important, right? And you try to honor that. Um, I want to hear more about how you think about just not, I don't know, vilifying the, the prison officer who's there and trying to do their best, uh, and how you think about breaking down some of the ways in which we other, even as we try to liberate. Totally. Uh, and I also want to just try to balance that with also sometimes we get into these conversations where it sounds like uh, it's a good thing that somebody's incarcerated because they get access to mental health services that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So these two things converge for me, which are just, I think, uh, in some ways they're soft concepts, but they really are deeply invested in in the spaces that you occupy. The, People with, with good hearts and good intention are doing things that I would consider being part of a really harmful system. As a trained pediatrician, I know I'm also part of a really harmful system. Um, and sometimes this argument of at least they're getting education, at least they're getting healthcare, at least they're getting mental health services. Um, so isn't is prison almost a good thing? How do you how do you think about those? It's a great question. That's a complex. That's a yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, our world is extraordinarily polarized right now. Yeah. And I think one of the things that has stuck out to me working within the prison system and also within the academic sphere in Seattle and the prison system in rural Eastern Washington, a red part of our state. Yeah. And Seattle academia, one of the bluer places you can be, um, is, that it just like speaks to so many of the divides that we have in our country. And I really appreciate that. I think we often end up in conversations where we're talking to a lot of people who think just like us. And one of the things I appreciate about some of the work that I do is that I really like, if I want to change systems, I need to, be able to hear and be heard by people who are working within those systems. Yeah. And as you said, it's all about relationships. It's about like, let's talk about hypertension. Let's talk about what we did this weekend. When I'm out in Eastern Washington, I live in an RV park next to the prison. I live in a trailer. Yeah. Like, let's talk about trailer repairs, right? Let's be really human. Wow. And that's how we can build this relationship. And maybe then we talk about, huh, how do we help this individual who has opioid use disorder, who needs to get on medication for their opioid use disorder that maybe you kind of have some political opposition to, that that is, hasn't typically been, that, that for a long time was contraband in prison and not a medication. That buprenorphine was seen only as contraband and not as medicine. And here I am coming in and saying, buprenorphine is medicine. But maybe the approach is, let's have a relationship and like, People are going to medicine for this person. Like, we don't want this person to overdose. What's they, our shared goal? What's our shared goal? Our shared goal is, like, that this person goes out and, like, doesn't use drugs when they're released from prison and right. that they don't die of an opioid overdose. And, like, here we are walking side by side towards this shared goal. And, like, well, if this person needs it, then maybe this whole clinic needs it. Um, and then it's not about the political stand I'm taking. It's about the relationships and the working towards the shared goal and figuring out the language to use. And do I always do this well? No. And do I work within a system that causes harm? Absolutely. And figuring out how to walk that line between reform and um, st striking this balance is challenging. Yeah. And I think, as you say, is the sort of argument that prison is a good place for people because they're getting some services. They have a roof over their head and they're getting three meals a day doesn't necessarily, I think the way that that would come up more for me is the thought of does improving conditions in prison mean propping up a mass incarceration system? And I think 
Not necessarily. That's a heavy question. Right? Yeah. That reform and, and that we think about harm reduction all the time in so many of our systems, in creating needle exchanges and in offering fentanyl test strips and Narcan, right? An overdose is certainly a harm, but we want to reduce the harms of things as much as we can. And that often we're offering harm reduction right alongside substance use treatment. Um, and so I think we need to just be thinking about that as we holding that duality. Um, we can do that, world. right? We can, we can think about complex things and we don't have to boil them down into single solution answers. We're not monolithic. We're not um, not monovalent in the ways that we need to understand the things happening around us. You're a good person. You You're a really good person. And I, um, I'm thankful that you are where you are. And um, there's probably some shoulders that you get to stand on in order to do what you do. Um, and I hope that they recognize uh, that their faith in you as well, well vested. I really appreciate you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the work you do and I'm inspired both by the actions you've taken, but also your perspective on how we need to radically rethink so many of our assumptions. So thank you. Love to hear. It would be cool if we were like in front of other people who maybe had like questions <laughs> developed over time. And, and I don't know if there's a way for us to project it. To... Yeah. Any oh, oh. Questions <laughs> Um, thank you both so much. This is such a helpful conversation for me and my practice and my research. Um, I'm curious, you both spoke a little bit about incorporating lived experience into not only your community advisory boards, but also how you're understanding these systems and the experiences within them. I'm curious about how you think about the most stigmatized of lived experiences like psychosis and suicidality and including those kinds of voices in these conversations about decarceration and how these folks are typically the most caught up in these systems and discounted because of sanest, ableist ideologies, um, not only within carceral systems, but also within medicine and our practice as well. I would say it's like breaking down all of these stigmas and our extremely hierarchical medical research educational systems to prioritize expertise through lived experience is really hard. Um, and we don't work in systems where it's like really easy to pay people for their time as a one-off, like even the logistical things involved in prioritizing people's time and finding the space yeah. and figuring out ways to pay them and all of the things that have to happen to do equitable like inclusion is is hard. Um, in my work in Zimbabwe, um, we're doing a multi-country survey to try to identify expert perspectives on what priorities should be around research in prisons in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've done a Delphi across 24 countries where we're surveying all these people to say, okay, there are so many problems, like where do we even start? And we wanted to make sure that we included expertise from people with lived experience. And so that's hard to cultivate in an online survey across a bunch of countries. And building that from the ground up is hard. And, and what we did was partner with an organization um, and include someone from, a, on our, have an advisory board that included someone with lived experience who actually runs an organization that includes a bunch of people with lived experience who had built those relationships. Um, because I think that, that connection and the long, I think someone once told me it takes a 10 year commitment to a place that a problem to make meaningful change. And I think like trying to slowly build those relationships and learn from systems and include systems where those relationships already exist is really powerful. So I'm so curious about your- That last bit you said, that's where I was tapping in completely. As long as we are not infusing uh, the things that we're doing with really sincere relationship uh, building. It sounds corny, but I, I think the humanizing of people's experiences, the the connection that tells that tells you, like, um, I actually want to take more of a risk with you because because I know you. Uh, we've, we've shared time together. We've eaten together. We we uh, you have horrible taste in music. I just want to say that, but <laughs> but I'm also willing to dance with you. Like the the things that build relationship are also the things that I think unbuild the stigmatization that we tend to do. And I, that's just one piece. Another piece to me is just the, 
I'm all guilty of this, but what is this thing where we decide one person's neurodiversity is, is maladaptive and someone else's is somehow uh, really cool and good? Why do we reward uh, very strange, um, uh, say, obsessive behaviors that, that allow you to advance in the way we structure some of our, oh, I don't know, educational systems and stuff like that? Another thing I would say is that um, that uh, it relates to me to a conversation about about trauma. Um, and uh, I don't know why I want to say this in this particular setting, but we talk about trauma as if it only causes bad things and is a disabling experience to people. I don't want anybody to have to suffer through trauma. I also know uh, incredibly brilliant people who think about things in much more um, thoughtful ways who have incredible problem solving approaches who are more creative and iterative, who can come up with ideas that nobody else comes up with. And it's informed by their trauma. As long as we say, you're not allowed to have an opinion about the way the systems work or even about your own your own uh, incarcerated or unincarcerated self because, because we pity you because you've faced trauma. We have to change that conversation. And I think it's a bit related to changing the way we think about uh, ableism and sanism in this space as well. And finally, this one more related is is to me about um, about brain science and uh, sitting through this legislative session right now and, and watching people talk about um, things like resentencing policies and things for young people. And one part of it is so infuriating to me because the argument for changing somebody's sentence is sometimes invested in this idea of, oh my God, these are underdeveloped brains because they're only 18 or 19 or 20. And what we know about brain science is that these brains are not done developing until they're 25. What kind of bullshit is that? <laughs> like, um, there's a brilliance and an intelligence and an amazing capacity for making choices and decisions that is there at 12 and, and, and another kind of when you're 14 and 15 and 16. Uh, and there's a lot of it, a really great, great creative um, ideas and brains act actually there. And for us to say that uh, you're not culpable because your brain wasn't finished cooking yet is um, is such a disempowering kind of way to approach uh, something. It's, it's really insulting to me. And these are the people who are sort of on my side around reform activities and things like that. So as long as we start, we keep labeling somebody's brain, behavior, mental uh, functioning, as somehow less than because mine isn't exactly the same way. And of course, mine is the normal one. Uh, I think we'll continue to struggle and we won't have as great ideas and we won't work as well together and we'll keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And boy, is this country really good at making the same mistakes over and over again. That was not an answer to your question, but I really wanted to say all this. Hi. Um, I have this feeling that the criminal legal system is highly punishment based. Um, part sure. of the philosophy, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, it's an idea. Uh, part of the idea being that if we punish people, they will learn from their behaviors and they will change their behaviors. But if we're coming at this framework of mental illness or even substance abuse or drug addiction, and we say, if I punish this person, they just won't do this next time. To me, that seems counterintuitive. If you re-traumatize someone, their mental illness may just get worse. And then we have a cycle. So if, if this is the current system, if by chance, um, what do you envision would be a better version of this that we can avoid this cycle? You know how when you ask a question, you kind of imply the solution. Yeah, tell me. I mean, what, what is, you're coming from a space where you're really saying that um, our ability to actually um, reach in when people are, are really suffering, when people have faced harm, instead of uh, reaching back or naming one moment as a crime and not paying any attention to all the harms that that same person actually experienced coming into that moment or not understanding that in some ways, sometimes what we call a crime is actually a very, very logical and uh, good decision, I'm gonna say. Uh, this isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> But there's all different ways of thinking about about how we construct punishment based on an event um, and completely divorce uh, the whole concepts of, of what has come before that. 
and it allows us not to think about where the fault really lies, which is our oppressive and racist ecosystems that really kind of converge in people's lives so much. And so uh, we're changing the conversation away from, even from like what happened to you um, and talk more about what did, what did the systematic approach do wrong in this setting? I think you start to think about very different solutions. But I was also uh, in this community group uh, last night. Uh, we're trying to do these really bold things. So we have really stupid names for our group and it's called uh, Racism is a Public Health Crisis. And we've, we've been charged with sort of uh, distributing $25 million to King County folks uh, in the name of this and thinking about how to change the way government works and stuff like that. Um, and it's it's really great opportunity to actually transform government and actually be anti-racist and to be pro-black and pro-human uh, in so many different ways, to be pro-indigenous and pro-human. And um, and we got kind of waylaid in like not liking one person's behavior. And we've spent three meetings now trying to delve into how do we address this one person's behavior? And um, it felt really similar to me about seeing somebody in a moment or even a series of moments and really expressing all that you talked about, about um, the reasons why you would not believe that a group of people would actually be wanting to work together um, in the name of supporting someone who's been so oppressed uh, as an identified woman, as an identified black person, as a, uh, a person who's uh, been held down socioeconomically in so many different ways. Why would you believe that something was actually going to work differently? And how does that show up when you express that distrust? How do we need to show up differently to, to understand that and to listen to that, and to hear that and understand what's below that instead of saying, you said something mean and I don't like it. We don't want to work together. I think that's a particularly uh, weird Seattle Northwest thing also. Like if you don't, if you're not nice, somehow you're not like worthy of of, of love or able to uh, contribute functionally to the group dynamic or uh, I don't know. Like are our relationships so tenuous that if I spend one moment not being nice to you, suddenly everything that is about us is erased and I'm rambling really badly. So go ahead. So I think you like touched on an important point around. Okay. Or social norms and and sort of how they play into these conversations. And for me, when I think about a less punishment engaged system, there's a duality of what would a dramatically reimagined system look like, as you say, a proactively anti-racist, rehabilitation oriented system that we can imagine. And then I think there's the sort of reformist view of like, okay, that isn't the system we live in right now. And what are some steps that are happening or could happen? I think one angle of in within sort of the system reform pillar of that duality is to think about countries that actually do better. So the government of Norway has prisons that are remarkably better. Um, and I think they're based around three principles, which are make prison as much like the community as possible. So you are having responsibility, feeling engaged in real life things that have purpose, like jobs and relationships and wearing real clothes, having correctional officers have real relationships that you're sitting down and playing cards and having coffee and having a real relationship versus standing up against the wall with your arms crossed and thinking about shorter sentences and really healing, healing like a highly rehabilitative space. And um, there's actually a partnership between UCSF and um, the prison, Norwegian prison system to help bring these principles to different prison systems in the US. So they worked in North Dakota, they worked in Oregon, they worked in California, they're now working in Washington, doing a lot of culture change. And the way that they are working is not just coming in and saying like, hey, you need to do what Norway is doing, which is not always received well in a prison system, um, but by actually bringing leadership to Norway to talk to other people who work in prisons there 
And the people who work in prisons there are able to tell them, like, this is what we do. You person who has a very similar job to me, here's what we do and here's how it works. And it's reduced outcomes people, right, care about on their metric charts. And this is how you might bring about, so it's it's starting from a much less, I think often we think about like, let's go start a new project and do this thing where we're gonna change yeah. this versus starting from this, like we actually need to think about a culture shift yeah. and how do we rethink how things are working. And I, I think projects like this feel really positive because they're starting from a reform standpoint, from, but from a reform standpoint that's saying, how do we think different, differently about how we do this care. And it cares about your wellness instead of both the wellness of the staff and the wellness of people who are incarcerated. And I think it prioritizes both. And I was recently reading a study that in uh, I think North Dakota is reduced to use of solitary confinement by 70%. Like that's pretty good. Like it ought to be zero, but yeah. Ought to be zero, but you know, that's right? True. But zero is in sight. Yeah, you can see zero. Right. Yeah. We um if I say to you that we should not throw away human beings. I think most people agree with that. And then if we examine the systems that we've created, the ecosystems, the multi-systems that we've created, they are perfectly designed to throw people away. Um, we gotta ask, I think, more questions of, of that. I think we have to examine uh, what sometimes we would call fear and the way fear is manipulated. Uh, in news media uh, to dehumanize people and to create a justification for us to throw 